are going to call this historic meeting to order. We are going to start this meeting with a flag salute. Can, would you all rise? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Mrs. Richardson, can we have a roll call? Present. 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 Not here. Yet. Here. Present. 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 Okay, we have a special meeting tonight. The only the only item on our special meeting tonight is the Pasco School District um, COVID response plan. This will be presented by Mrs. Michelle Whitney. We will allow time afterward for a board response, and then we will allow time for um, for audience response. So good evening, board president, Phillips, and members of the board. It was only Tuesday when I was in front of you to give you an update, so things definitely evolved quickly, and I think on Tuesday I promised that I would not be the next board report in front of you, so I broke my promise. I'm sorry, but I am here this evening to give you an update on our district response plan. Um, the original intent of this plan was to discuss with you some parameters around decision making for closing school in the face of COVID. But since then, we, um, there has been extensive, clo extensive closer closures across uh, the state, nationwide and internationally. Things from NBA, the National, uh, or the Baseball League, Disneyland closed, not only and then uh, in addition to school districts. And the closures have been attributed to the concept of what's called flattening the curve to slow the spread of the COVID-19 virus. Governor Inslee, uh, this certainly his announcement today changed the topic of this meeting. Um, that announcement closed schools across Washington State starting on uh, Tuesday, March 17th. The closure is tentatively scheduled to last through uh, April 24th. During the closures, Governor Inslee commented in his press conference today that he expected or directed that employees would continue to work, work may look different, that school district would continue to pro provide nutritional services, school district would assist with child care for health care workers and first responders, and some program of a study would continue for our 12th, uh, 11th and 12th graders. So I just also wanted to inform the board, this conference or the press conference happened at 1.30 this afternoon, so this is very new information to us as a school district. So we know what we are going to do immediately. So in the, the immediate plan is to continue school on Monday, March 16th. We recognize that attendance may be impacted both from students and staff. We do have a plan to deploy additional staff to buildings where staff absences would undermine the regular functions of that building. Uh, if a student, if a family chose not to send students to school on Monday, that would be an excused absence. The close of school, and, and our reasoning for keeping schools open on Monday is to allow at least a day's preparation or a weekend and a day's preparation for families because this news happened so quickly for some. Um, the, the, we would be closing schools and district buildings to students, parents, and the community starting Tuesday, March 17th, and be prepared to deliver a modified student uh, food service starting on Tuesday, September 17th. So the food services in the, for, in the short term are like phase one of that plan, again, would start on Tuesday. It would be a breakfast and lunch, quote unquote, grab and go at each school. This means that there would be no designated school boundaries. You would go to the school closest to you, even maybe if that's not where you go to school regularly. And so any, kid, any student can go to any school to pick up a bagged breakfast and lunch, and they would pick them both up at the same time. They would have their food service for the day. Students, um, those meals would include items like cereal bars and juice for breakfast, sandwiches, chips, fruit, and milk for lunch. So they'll definitely look different than our regular food service, but would be a source of calories and nutrition for our students during the closures. 
Phase two would potentially start the following Monday where we would do meal delivery to our geographically isolated areas. So if we notice some of our students weren't able that typically ride a bus to school or don't live close to a school, if we're noticing that they can't get to a, 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 a school site for meals, we would then be delivering those would, meals to those students, potentially using, we have snow routes where, um, and they're designated little depot spots. We, so we have some routes that are already familiar, familiar to our community. We could direct our students to go to those routes and we would bring food service to them there. We would be using our Blackboard communication tool for our families who take advantage of transportation and our regular communication platforms to keep parents and students informed as, again, those nutrition services services continue to evolve for our community and then phase three where it would be determined based on needs so if we saw there's a specific need in the community that wasn't being addressed with our phase one and phase two implementation we would be prepared to implement or plan and implement and deploy a, a tertiary phase to make sure that all of our students are getting nutrition services so that's the short-term plan, kind of the short-term and long-term plan for food services. That was really important to us that our families knew that they would have a predictable, stable source of food, um, especially for our most vulnerable families that have food insecurity. We are engaged in contingency planning, and the contingency planning will be a, an evolution and we'll be layering in um, kind of m more specific layers of the plan over time. There are bargaining implementation or implications that will need to be addressed with our labor partners. So we'll be partnering with our labor groups to explore options for work functions that are supportive and productive and keep people safe in the face of our COVID virus. So employees will continue to be paid. Staff will continue to have access to their work sites. We'll encourage will continue to encourage employees who are sick to stay home. And I think it's really important to point out that we want all sick people to stay home, not just those who think they may have been exposed or have the COVID virus. If you have a cold, you have strep throat, you have whatever you have going on, you need to be staying home. And I think it's really important that at this time that we are very cautious in applying judgment to people who are choosing to stay home. Just because people are choosing to stay home doesn't mean they have COVID or are afraid that they have COVID or have been exposed to COVID. I had some conversations with people in the last few days that concern me in that people are afraid, like I just have allergies or a sore throat, but I'm afraid to stay home because I don't want my colleagues to think I have COVID. So I think it's very important that we remain very diligent around um, combating stigma and passing judgment on our people who are working really hard to take good care of themselves. So the district will review sick leave policies to ensure flexibility and consistency with public health policies and guidance um, and make sure that staff are aware of those policies. We have some longer term planning that needs to occur and we'll start roll up our sleeves Monday morning and dig into that. I have a meeting with my uh, superintendent friends from both Richland and Kennewick first thing eight o'clock Monday morning to do some coordinated efforts around planning. And those would be things like child care for families who don't have access to another form of care support for our most vulnerable families. We have special education students, some that have very fragile, me, fragile medical needs. We need to be very thoughtful about how we support families over a six week closure. So when I say long term, I'm not talking three weeks, I'm talking, you know, in like not, not Monday, but maybe Tuesday, Wednesday. So um, we need to get right on top of providing services for those students because we recognize that they rely on us as a school system for those. We also have students who are in unpredictable home homes or homeless. We need to be very mindful about finding, um, making sure that they have service. And then again, making sure that we're dealing with the food insecure. While we have the new, um, a, a, a plan to provide school lunches and breakfast and lunch for students, our community rely on a number of our school sites who have food pantries as a source of family to, to combat family food insecurity. So fairly quickly, we'll want to explore how we maintain some access to for those families that are um, experiencing food insecurity and then services to support our healthcare workers and first responders. Again, under long-term planning, we're gonna be taking a look at some academics. So the things that we're, we're planning to explore are academic resources and activities for families. Are there things that we can send home with them on, on Monday while we have them? Are there online resources that we can provide after that that they can take advantage of um, over, the, over the closure? And then 
um, making sure our, our students that our secondary students all have one-to-one -one devices so um, ensuring that they're taking those home with them on on Monday so they have access to them over the the break or the closure we continue to I just put this out in front of you as a reminder I did talk to you about this on Tuesday I checked the OSPI website right before coming in here there is still waiver language on the OSPI website so the state officials um, are planning for an emergency or a, a, an emergency rule that would allow waiving of days we would have to make every effort to make up lost instructional time and that could mean things like using other days that were designated for closure or even um, holidays to try to make up instructional time or days and we would then also be required to go to school to the 19th of um, June at a minimum to make up the the time the OSPI has also canceled all state testing for the 1920 school year that includes all of the the battery of tests that are listed there the SBA the WCAS etc cetera, etc cetera, all of the alphabet soup of testing that our students in endure over a school year has been canceled for for 1920. I left this is not a new slide for you as a board and I left it in here intentionally for two reasons one to tell the story that I just told you about um, some of the narrative that I'm hearing in the community around people feeling uncomfortable about having a common cold or sore throat but I also was I meet with our superintendent student advisory council we just met on Wednesday and I was very disheartened to hear that some of our students have heard and or experienced themselves stigma stigmatizing statements um, in our school system so based on that it, I don't think it's ever a bad to remind us again that kindness and compassion is always the right answer even in and especially in the face of great tension and fear that this that communities across Washington State are experiencing um, so it's a great reminder to all of us to be to be kind and to be mindful of that so don't assume because someone is staying home with an illness that they have COVID so with that I would um, welcome any questions or clarifications for me I am sure there are things and lots of what abouts well what about this have you thought about that we want to hear those we'll add them to the list I have amazing partners who have really doubled down in supporting this organization over the last 24 36 72 hours um, I do want to comment before I, I hand it to you President <coughs> Phillips I am proud to work in this organization every day and in the face of this unprecedented impact to our community our staff has doubled down for this community and kids and I have never been so proud to work shoulder to shoulder with such a fine group of people from the teachers in our buildings to our principals to the administrative staff here it is just my extraordinary honor to be part of the team so with that President Phillips thank you thank you for that report we'll turn the time over now for the board for any questions and discussion um, so you mentioned online learning uh, so I was wondering how would you address a problem that you know some students might not have access to internet and as far as I know some libraries are closed as well so that's not even an option no thank you for the opportunity to clarify so what we would be offering is just access to things for students to do should they choose not online required instruction so this is just you know we have uh, online curriculum so students could go on and do activities um, but it wouldn't be like delivering required instruction because as I reported on Tuesday one of the things that was very important to OSPI and the guidance that we received is, is if we can't provide that instruction for all then it's in it's creating an inequity so we will not be providing organized instruction online but there are online access or there are materials online that students could access should they choose I saw some news, um, just recent news, that Charter was going to offer free internet for students that don't already have internet in their family. So I was, you know, hoping we'd get some information about that out there for people. And then also, I was curious if a lot of some of our students have uh, laptops that they can take home from the school district. Some of them have laptops or computers from their family at home. But for those that don't, do we have additional? Um, devices that they could check out during that time sign up through you know through charter if they don't have internet and continue to take advantage of that online learning we'll certainly add it to the list of things logistics to plan for 
I'm curious. Will uh, for seniors or other students, will curric when they do return, will curriculum shorten technically, and then they just go on from where they initially, you know, stopped and just pick up again? So that's a great question, and what I will tell you is what I heard today about 11th and 12th graders is different than what I heard the last time I listened to Superintendent Reichdahl and the governor. So what I would tell you is what's happening for 11th and 12th graders is evolving. So we'll have to keep a really close eye on that and make sure that we're clear about those expectations for 11th and 12th graders. So we're just going to have to be a little bit patient and, and live in a world of ambiguity for a little bit, but we'll keep a great eye on it for you as seniors for sure. So uh, I know that there are some SAT tests um, scheduled to come this weekend and in the weeks um, following that. So do you know if College Board has announced that they're canceling those or are those still on schedule? I have not heard directly from College Board. The, the direction that has been given is that any event over 250 people is canceled. I don't, I'm not sure how many students set for SATs. Um, so we'll, we can check in with College Board. I have not seen a notification from College Board, but we can check on that. On the slide that shows the state testing that, that there's relief from for the 1920 school year, are there any state mandated graduation requirements that there is relief from? I don't have the answer to that, but we can certainly explore it. So thank you, Mrs. Whitney. I know this has been a, a fast moving day. And so there's a lot of information that we just don't have. So I appreciate the, the presentation you guys have put together so far. I know there's going to be a lot more to come as we, as we move through this. And it's not just our district, it's the state, it's the nation, it's the entire world that's working through these things. So, and, and I think uh, <clears throat> the thing that we have to have right now is a little bit of patience and understanding with what's going on. It's, there's a lot of unanswered questions right now, and I think um, some of us might feel that we're being a little overly cautious, and, and maybe so. Hindsight will tell us whether we're right or wrong on this. But um, I think the thing to do right now is just be patient. Let's work through it. You guys have done a great job. I think you'll continue to do that. I'm, I'm interested in hearing what the community has to say as well, but thank you for the presentation. I'm confident that you guys will continue the great work. Thank you. And I am, what, right now there's a chance. I mean, we know it's gonna be, we know school's going to be canceled now through the 24th of April. There's a good chance it could be canceled for the rest of the school year. And um, this is unprecedented in, in, I believe, the country's history. And we are the first state in, in the union because of the high um, influx of this disease in our state to close all of our schools. So this is very serious and I don't even know if the gravity of what is happening has really hit us all. But I am concerned. Um, I was just a little girl when in, um, Mount St. Helens erupted and we missed the last month of school. And, um, and I still remember it. And once again, another historic event. This could be even more impactful. The concerns that I have are our children are going through school right now. If they're in geometry, they're going to be expecting to take algebra two. If they're in freshman English, they're going to be expecting to take sophomore English. There is a different, in, I think it will impact our elementary school students a little bit differently as some of those things can be made up over the years. But with our high school students, I am very concerned. We also have students that are preparing right now for the AP tests. Um, you know, I, I know these are questions you probably don't know the answer to. We were, um, we had a letter from a gentleman that talked about his son who was going, who was, um, looking for a scholarship and, and this track and field was a huge season for them. And that can make a huge financial difference in our family's lives. So there's so many things that we need to do. Are, are we going to address those things, especially with our high school students? Um, if all of these kids have computers and they have access, will they be able to catch up or are teachers going to be playing catch up next year? Are we going to have some kind of online curriculum so that our students can be prepared for these AP classes? Are we going to be able to administer these tests? I know you don't know all of the answers, but do you have any even direction for any of that? <laughs> Honestly, my focus in the last 36 hours, you have to, you have to think about until 1.30 today, the wait was 
do I recommend to you tonight to close school? So that was my sole focus until 1.30 this afternoon when the governor made that decision for us. So I have not had a chance to even think about all of those very important questions that you just answered or asked, but I promise you after a good night's sleep Saturday and Sunday, I will be in Monday, I'll dig up my sleeves and we'll have answers, or I'll roll up my sleeves and I'll have answers to those. Well, you're not gonna be able to do all of this and I appreciate you trying, <laughs> but. Oh, I mean I, we're the collective <laughs> I. <laughs> Do you know what I love about our country? Because anytime I've seen anything like this happen to our country, the whole community comes around. That's right. That's right. You know, I'm a math teacher. I would be happy to tutor kids over the phone. Um, and I have no doubt the community will step forward and do all that we can for our children, for what's best for them, for their nutritional needs, for their educational needs. And so I'm, I am proud to be an American because that's what happens in America whenever there is anything like this. That's right. So I know it will happen, and I hope that all of us here will make that happen as well. That's right. Um, because I, I know we can, we can soften this blow for our kids, and I know that we can, we can come together as a community and make things as, as good as we can under the circumstances. Ms. Whitney, again, uh, thank you for, for this, and I know it's rushed. Um, but uh, uh, the kids uh, have heavily impacted, and I think there's a lot of concern about that. And I'm looking through the, through the PowerPoint here, and uh, it says uh, uh, employees will continue to work. Is that all employees certified and classified? So that is the governor, that was the governor's direction. So working conditions is something that we partner with our labor unions around. So there's a lot of details around that that we've yet to, um, engage in with our labor unions but again we had uh, just brief conversations about the recognition that we need to do that and so we have people mobilizing to get around a table and figure out what do those working conditions look like over the next six weeks are there any other questions from the board So I'm reading through the PowerPoint as well, and it says the state test, OSPI has canceled state testing for the year uh, 2019 and 2020. Um, will kids have to take this next year, like right away as soon as they are back to school, or how is that gonna go? I don't believe that's the intent, Max. I think we've, they've canceled the testing schedule this year. I think when we get back to, like when the school year starts next year, we start over as a, a, a testing schedule. I think it would be, really unfair and unreasonable to think that kids would be out of school and then come back and take you know i just don't see that happening i think they've canceled the testing schedule we'll pick up next year's testing schedule um, as it's implemented one thing i appreciate about the state testing this the star tests give us really a great picture of where we're at right now the state tests give us a picture of where we were and and I don't, I don't feel that they are critical to our success as a district. Um, so I am not terribly sad about that, but, um, but I am grateful for the other things that we have that we can monitor success and, and, um, and make adjustments. It is now time for the, the audience to, um, to make comments, and we do welcome your comments. There are a lot of you here, and so I would appreciate it if you could follow the rules that are outlined by our, by our board policies. <coughs> I will remind you of those rules. Please state your name and affiliation with the district. Comments need to be kept to two minutes. So you will, for the first minute and a half you, that you will speak, um, you can just go on speaking. At 30 seconds left, Mrs. Thornton will raise a yellow flag and you'll know you have 30 seconds left. At um, two minutes, the red um, peachy folder will be, will be um, shown. If you don't have time to finish your comment, please email the board or contact the superintendent's office. We do want to make sure that you had time for all of your comments and that, and that your um, concerns can be resolved. I will interrupt if you go too far into that two minutes. We do have a lot of people here and I do want everyone to be heard, so please keep your, um, keep your comments short. Thank you.
Hello, Maria Lee, speaking as an individual, um, 1931 West Agate, Pasco. Um, two things. So first of all, by um, not having the SBAC test, just so that the board knows, as a fifth grade teacher, that gives me back three weeks of instructional time. So I realize that everybody is kind of panicked over what are the kids going to do. I know in my building alone, we were all running around, what is it that we can send home with our kids on Monday? things like books, packets, so we're very much aware of that instructional time that's being lost and what we can do to make that up. The other thing is a question, and this came from a, a special education teacher, and her question was, what will happen to those IEPs that will expire during this particular season that we're um, facing? Just something to be aware of, and that's my only question. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't even thought about that. That's a great question. I'm sure that will be addressed in the near future. My name is Daniel Gerhards. I am a substitute teacher in Pasco, and that I appreciate Jesse Campos uh, was uh, asking about um, employees and continuing to work and getting paid and. Um, but uh, I'm not sure that substitutes have been thought about um, because we all still have our own, you know, rent and we have to feed our children and so on. So I wonder if there's anything that we will be allowed to do or able to do um, in this or during this time so that we can get paid as well. Thank you. I'm a substitute too, and I'm sure the answer to that will, will come as well. Hi, my name's Elizabeth Garza, and um, I'm a parent to a kid that um, is in the special needs program. And um, I just want to make sure, and I'm sure it's a concern or a topic you guys have brought up, but I just want to make sure that our kids are being remembered and considered um, because our kiddos can't just stay with anybody. And so I'm just worried about this six month, or six weeks, sorry, um, time what that's going to look like for us that work full time and maybe aren't going to get that time off kind of where our kids will be and what that's going to look like not all of the families have places for those kids to go and like I said in trust so just something I hope that you guys are really considering and worrying about I guess thank you thank you I, I appreciate that we'll definitely look into that Hello, my name is Ana Ruiz, and I am here in the capacity of board chair for Tri-Cities Community Health. Tri-Cities Community Health has two school-based clinics, one in Ochoa and one in Amistad. We are uh, here to say we're going to remain open to the ability that we can uh, staff it, You're recognizing that we might have um, some uh, staffing problems, but we will be open to the best ability that we can, and we're here to continue partnering with the school district as we've done it before. Thank you. Thank you for that information. I hope we get all kinds of information like that so we can make that information available to our students and their families. <coughs> yeah, I guess I had a question, it, and it ties in, uh, Mr. I see Mr. Ace here, and, and uh, that Miss, uh, the lady over there had the question about children and uh, child care. Is there any partnership um, with the Boys and Girls Club that will continue while we're closed? 
Yeah, as a matter of fact, Susan Sparks and Brian Ace, who's in the audience, um, have been meeting, have been talking all week and then met today. So there is pretty robust conversation going on around that. So I wouldn't be surprised if we weren't able to roll something out fairly quickly around child care. It's been a real focus of concern for us. We recognize that this is the greatest hardship for families, especially those that don't already have designated child care. So I applaud Brian and, and um, Susan for being really proactive in that regard. And those kinds of answers would be on the frequently asked questions portion of the district webpage? So as each layer of planning is completed, we'll push that out via all of our regular communication mechanisms that include the website, the district app, push notifications to parents through our um, alert system, put it on the website, et cetera. So we'll use all of our regular communication mechanisms. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, it takes the whole community and it's nice to see the partners' uh, faces out here, and thank you all for everything you do to partner with the Pasco School District and for showing up to support tonight and the support that you'll help provide in the next uh, six or more weeks here. Thank you. I also wanted to recognize uh, Mr. Dawson from the Benton Franklin County Community Health or Health Department is here um, as a resource for anyone with, that has questions for him. He's right back here in the audience, but also as a, a supporter to be here tonight. We certainly appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Dawson. Yes, thank you. Um, is there a point of contact we have? I know there's going to be so there's going to be so many parents that have questions about childcare, about about you know how to keep their students on track. Do we have a point of contact at the district office? So that's a great question. One of the things we did very quickly this afternoon after uh, Governor Inslee's. Um, press conference was we sent out talking points to all of our departmental secretaries and then we also reached out and Franklin County Emergency Management set, sent some additional support to help answer phones so we have a common script with common language common talking points and a variety of people who can field questions the other thing that we have is we have a specified COVID email that is on our website um, and we're really encouraging people if it's not an urgent like I need to know right now um, like eminent answer to shoot those emails to the COVID email. Uh, Aubrey Pitzer is collecting those as themes and then we meet daily and we run through all of those questions, answer them and then put them up on the website. And it helps us to, to know what the community is thinking in a very organized way. So I would encourage people when you call, you're gonna get someone by phone. Um, if you have to leave a message, leave one, someone will call you back. The, the really the most efficient way is to send something to or send an email to that email that email address and they'll get an email response and then it also helps us inform the broader community who maybe didn't think of that question so it's really really helpful can you tell us what that email address is it's probably covid19 at psd1.org <laughs> oh excuse me covid it was did it have the dash covid19 <laughs> info at psd1.org okay. all COVID all the time yeah okay. <laughs> this has been extraordinarily helpful for us as district staff and we had hoped what just happened would happen it helps inform us what are those things that we haven't thought about that we needed to think about what's important to our students what's important to you as a board and what's important to our community so I just really appreciate people's time diligence and effort and coming and sharing their thoughts with us it helps us in our planning so that we can be of service to those that we are tasked with being of service to thank you I'm gonna give the audience one more time if anybody would like to come up and speak at this time I want to make sure your voices are heard Hi, yeah, my name is Dale. I'm a parent. Um, I was wondering what's going to happen after the fact it's all done. Uh, what's the cleaning process going to be for the school district and how it's going to help out our children later on down the process and what, what's going to be baseline for them when they come back to school, and what the cleaning process is going to be there for them washing their hands or cleaning their self, what, what needs to be done after the fact this is all done. Does anybody want to, I know we've been going through yeah. some extraordinary measures already to clean the buildings, so I'm, but I'm not the one who can do this. I mean, as parents, we can teach our children proper hand washing techniques, our, you know, fingerprint, fingerprints, making sure we're washing them, making sure we're doing it for a lengthy amount of time. It's the number one way to, to not spread this virus. So that's critical, but that's all I know. So I'm turning right. So the operational staff has been really proactively thinking about that. And we are talking about the timing. So if we know that 
and I think this timing is going to be a little sticky. So one thing that could happen is we actually go back to school on the 24th of April. The other thing that could happen is that we get to the 24th of April and it gets extended. So we have been talking about how do we spin operations back up um, and the operational staff is prepared with the appropriate products and the right amount of um, equipment to be able to go in and clean our schools and get them ready for um, people to come back. Um, it, we would continue the precautionary measures that we started. It's kind of like we would enter the same way we exited. As kids left, we were, you know, kind of keeping our distance from each other. We were washing our hands. We, you know, all of those things. We would keep those those precautionary measures in place. Um, but Steve Story and his team have a plan for how we would make sure that our schools were ready to receive kids again. The t the, the the difficult part is going to be the timing of that and, and the timing of it up against kind of the governor's, everyone can go back to school. So we'll have to be thinking about reentry differently than, for example, a snow day. Um, and, and that's on our minds already. Hi, uh, my name is Chris Babinski, um, teacher. Um, I have some staff, fellow staff members that have some questions about how coaching pay is going to be affected for uh, the spring term. And so. It's on our list. <coughs> Good evening. My name is Terrence Taylor. I'm here in several different capacities. First as a parent. Um, secondly, as the coordinator for the Pasco Discovery Coalition, which is a substance abuse coalition here in Pasco, and also as a faith leader, pastor for the New Movement Church, and wanted to just suggest um, some resources if the board is, is needing first uh, in the capacity of prevention um, at times of um, <clears throat> high alert crisis, uh, we can see kids that are at risk uh, maybe be more susceptible to substance abuse um, and some of the issues of supervision um, can increase uh, some risk. So there are some resources that the coalition could provide um, to the board to inform parents and help them during uh, this kind of six week stretch. And also just um, as a faith leader, if uh, our church and other churches in the area are willing to be um, places for a resource, um, other meeting places for any sort of distribution of information or sources to kids and just what whatever ways other organizations can partner with you to make that known in, uh, in what capacity. Thank you. That's a wonderful question. Is there going to be a way that we can that we can really gather in these volunteer resources that so we can use them and utilize them to the best of our ability for our children? Is there a volunteer contact or is that all the COVID info at PSD1.org? Call COVID all the time. Um, I would suggest that people who would like to volunteer start there and as we get a critical mass of volunteers we'll assign someone to be the volunteer coordinator. I'll volunteer to be the volunteer coordinator um, but that's great. I think you know you made the or someone made the comment that when or I think a couple of you did about when communities are facing great tension that it, it can be our finest hour and I think we'll have people step up in unanticipated ways. So the COVID email I think is a great way to start and then from there we can organize people to do um, the support like what um, was mentioned. Good evening, my name is Zara Roach and I'm here as a mother of uh, two of my children who go to the Pasco School District um, and as a former Pasco School District employee of seven years, classified and certified, um, as well as a city council member. Um, so as Ana Rui said, I'd like to offer whatever partnership that we can and continue our communication that I know has already started and will continue. But um, uh, the sharing of resources, one of the things that I wanted to bring up that the health, Washington Health Benefit Exchange has announced to those folks who are uninsured that they will for a special um, time period, I believe it's April 1st through, um, uh, excuse me, from now until April 8th, uh, 
that they will be enrolling people who do not have insurance. And so that is something that um, we might want to offer in some capacity in, uh, via email or on the website to families that do not have insurance. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for that information. I want to thank you all for coming. There's been kind of a somber mood here, and, and I appreciate, and also a feeling of love and support. I appreciate all of that. I know we're going to make it through this and hopefully, and hopefully protect um, especially our, our um, senior groups that are so at risk for this, and that hopefully we can slow this and, and prevent many, many illnesses and many deaths in this. You know, um, extraordinary times call for an extraordinary measures, and I know our community is up to this. You know, we will be looked at from years to come, whether we do this right or whether we do it wrong, and there's probably going to be a little bit of both. But um, we will be plotted for our efforts and probably criticized a bit for our, our shortcomings, but we can always learn from what we have been through. So it will be interesting to see how things unfold. Thank you for your support. Um, Please look to the, the district website. We, we will need your help. We're going to need everybody's help. As much as um, Ms. Whitney would love to have her staff do everything, it's just not possible. So um, thank you. All I've heard tonight is support from everybody, and I have no doubt that that will continue to come. So thank you so much. Um, this meeting will adjourn. <laughs>